Father, would you continue to build your church? As the Lord, from what we understand is that we gather, you build. We preach, but you minister. We worship, and you do something amazing. So I'm asking that, God, you would continue to build your church. Uh, Holy Spirit, help us to be glorious in what we do and putting on the splendor and the majesty of our great God. And now I'm asking, Holy Spirit, that you would help us as we look into your word, that you would speak to each one of us right where we may be. And I ask that um, this word would encourage, build, strengthen, but also give promise, give purpose, and help us in our time. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, how many of you have been ambushed? You kind of like remember the time when you, you, you saw that unbelievable deal in the shops. It's like you took it and then you went to the, 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 the till and instead of 10 rand, it was, t- uh, you know, 1,000 rand. <laughs> you go like, ah! This is not what I, it's like you feel like you were just ambushed. You don't know what to do. It's like the, the queue is backing up. You don't want to like, um, you know, and you just buy for it. It's like, ah. Or, or maybe, you know, remember when you thought you did really well? Oh, sorry. Please will blaze go. I was, <laughs> sorry. Ambushed. But you know what? Yeah, I was just being ambushed. I'm just, be, hey, kuda, don't ambush me again, all right? You, know, so you see, snuck up here. Yeah. Ambush means, you know, to lie in wait, sneak up, and then whoo! So, sorry, I forgot. All the uh, high school kids, um, you can go. But you should know that already. But those of you who are guests amongst us, if you don't know, brilliant. Take a walk out, and uh, you've got a great facility there for you. Remember that time when you thought you really did well at school or at, you know, varsity, whatever? You, you just thought you nailed that exam, and then you were ambushed with, like, a fail. Then I remember the time that, you know, I took up Latin at school. Latin. Now, I don't know why. I mean, they told me you have to take Latin if you want to be a lawyer. I didn't want to be a lawyer, but I had to take Latin. And, you know, I'm dyslexic, so a bow, a mass, a math, a mama, a matis, a munt is, a, is like the, some Latin that I do not know a bit, a bit, a bemis. How many of you could speak Latin? Anybody? Anybody took Latin at school, no yeah? One. No one. There, no one. <laughs> So, um, I mean, it was the most ridiculous subject I've ever taken, you know. Anyway, I, I, I took this, we did this test, and I was sent to the headmaster's office, Mr. Allswang. I mean, this is, I still remember his name, because I was ambushed with one out of a hundred. <laughs> I thought I'd passed, but I got one out of a hundred. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. But there may be other times where... Um, You may be in ambush living in this country. You may have been physically ambushed. I remember getting the call from Andy from to say that she had been running and two men had attacked her. And I think that there's many of us who have been hijacked or been attacked. There's an they kind of lie in wait. There's an ambushing. But really, I'm not wanting to sort of maybe talk more about the physical ambush. But there's other ambushes. You know, devastating news. That's what an ambush means. You can be. It just comes out of nowhere. It's just something happens, you weren't expecting it. As, uh, as I look out, I see Alex, I, I, I think you were ambushed uh, a year or so ago. Um, his ticker stopped ticking the right way, and you just ambushed. Um, I remember we were on a, on a sabbatical seven years ago, and two weeks before the end of the sabbatical, we were just looking forward to come back into church. We were rested and fresh. On the Thursday night, I got the call from my brother. Now, my brother doesn't phone me often, and he doesn't phone at 8, 9 o'clock at night. And uh, the devastating news that our brother in between us, he was 62 at the time, he had um, played a game of tennis, and on his way home, his mitral valve burst, and he passed away, just like that. Turned our lives upside down. I had to go down to White River, and he had to get involved in business and helping. And, and so, you know, there would be those things. I, I also remember uh, very vividly a moment when 30 years ago I'd sold my business uh, and I'd gone from, you know, in this, being in this business to what today's value being a multimillionaire. I just woo, made a lot of money. I was now rich. It was amazing. And what happened is I remember getting the call to the news that the guy who bought my business had actually done a dirty and stolen it from me. So I went from being in millions of rands worth of woo to 
millions of rands today's value in debt. Um, and I can still remember the fear, uh, the regret, the, the sleepless nights, the emotions that went through me around what I took my family through, all the things that was happening and the outworkings of that. Though as I look back on those times now, many years later, I see how God worked all things together for good to those that love him. In the time, whew, there was fear. Anybody never been ambushed before? <laughs> I think we're all, no one, no one, no one. This week as I, uh, I took a call from a friend and he just said, Craig, something really tough has happened in my business. And there, he said, in my spirit, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, but I am afraid. He says, it's just everything. Is, is, I need somebody to pray with. And so I, on the phone, I just began to pray. I just began to you know, pray with him. And we were, I was praying, and I was walking around my garden, and I'm, and I'm praying. But in that moment, I felt God begin to pour courage through a scripture that we, as a preaching team, had been meditating on, looking at it, 2 Chronicles 20. Um, I've also been looking at Psalm, uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 30. It's these occasions when through singing, through praising, God does incredible things. And we're looking at through Scripture because Ephesians chapter 5, where we are as a church in Let's Grow Up, yeah. as we are growing up and we are maturing, God is doing certain things in us. And we are seeing now as we get to Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18, that God is highlighting for us that we would be filled with the Spirit and then sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, making melody in our heart and thanking Him. And as much as it's just a little few lines, God has captivated us and said, hey, there's something here that I'm wanting to, you to experience, do and more. And what we've begun to experience is the congregation is singing louder and louder there's a voice that's coming into our hearts. There's people singing like never before. And God is using singing and praising and that. And it's not just here in this church. As we went across to 3CI last night, uh, last Sunday night, how many of you came across? Thank you for coming, guys. Well done. We know that God is doing something in our, let's say, our praise, our worship, our singing. So we go, God, what are you doing? So we've been looking in Scripture around this. And we're seeing, like in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, God, they put singers in the front of an army to go and fight a battle, and they win by singing. We see in Isaiah 30, as a prophet who prophesies, he says, when you sing songs in the night, God will then beat up the enemy. I go, wow. We see Paul and Silas, who are in the jail, and they sing hymns, and boom, God starts tapping his foot. The whole of heaven starts you know, uh, resonating with the praises of God, so does earth. And the next thing, prison doors are open, chains are broken. Go, wow, there's something in this singing, praising. God wants to unbutton our lips. Yeah. And so as I'm praying on the phone, I feel courage start coming. I feel like I begin to prophesy. Prophecy is putting courage in the hearts of the, the, uh, another person. It's, it's speaking the word of God so that faith comes for them to believe in God, not you. If you believe in a prophecy of someone, you've got the wrong, you're putting your faith in the wrong person. There is only one person we can have our faith in, and that's Jesus Christ. He is prophet, priest, and king. He does want to prophesy. He does want to speak. And I believe that God has sent me here today to prophesy. I'm not a prophet, okay? So I'm, if anything, a building prophet. So I build what is to come, not prophesy what's to come. But as a minister of the gospel, there are times where I feel like the spirit of prophecy comes over me. And I believe that there's a spirit of prophecy on me today to bring courage and strength to your heart. And I believe that God has sent me and you've come here, God has brought you here so that you could hear a message, so that you could put your faith in God and faith in His Word. And so if you would be open and ready to receive it, not as it, as it were, this is Craig, but this is God speaking and this is a collision, this is an encounter with God that it could change your destiny. And so as I begin, I'm praying, and I feel like God comes and starts prophesying, and I get hold of, you know, 1 Chronicles 20, 2 Chronicles 20, and I begin to pray this over him and into their business and all of that. And what it did is it caused me uh, to actually, I was so 
emboldened by what I prayed. I realized that God had been praying through me by the Spirit of God, that I went and actually said, well, I'm going to take a closer look at this. And I began to look at 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Um, it's about a king called Jehoshaphat. Say Jehoshaphat. It's like one of those, how do you spell that word? Jehoshaphat. Okay? And uh, he was a really good king. You know, when you read Kings and Chronicles in the Bible, you can sometimes get depressed. <laughs> it's like, and this guy did this, and he set up idols, and that, that, that. But Jehoshaphat was one of the good kings. In fact, his story starts in 2 Chronicles 17. And 2 Chronicles 17 talks about how at 35 years of age, he took over as king from his father. And it says, then he walked in the ways of his father, and he walked in the ways of his father, David. Now, David was many generations back from Jehoshaphat. But this was a description of him. In fact, his name means God has judged. So I go, well done to father of Jehoshaphat, because he understood that by calling his son God has judged, he was calling him as a great picture of Jesus Christ. You see, when we understand that Jehoshaphat, God has judged, means that God has judged my sin, he's no longer angry with me. We understand God's grace, all right? He said, on the cross, God's judgment was released against his only son to pay the price and the penalty of sin. Your sin, my sin. We had all fallen short of God. All have sinned and fallen short of God. God could judge you and me for our sin. Instead of that, he judged his son. This is good news, guys. This is the gospel, because most of us live under this thing that if I've sinned and now I've done wrong, God is going to be angry with me and he's going to punish me. But when you understand Jehoshaphat, we understand that God has punished his son and he would be an unjust God to punish his son, Jesus, and you for the same sin. Wouldn't that be? What kind of a God is that? So God has punished Jesus with your and my sin, all of it, the sins we've done, the sins we're going to do, for a whole world he loved so much, he did that. God is judged. Our sins have been judged on Jesus. So now we can live in the freedom to know that God is not angry with us. That the things that we find ourselves in, and when we are ambushed by the enemy, it's not because, oh, what have I done? Have I done this? Oh, did I sin? Did I do this? I want to tell you that God is not angry with you and he's not trying to punish you. I want to tell you this morning that God wants to bless you. And this is, the, this is the, the message. And as I began to, as I was on the phone, I realized this is what I said to, to, to my friend. I said this. I said, do you know that in this moment, it's God's intention to bless you? It's like, it doesn't feel like it. doesn't look like it. And I want to show you in this story what I found in that moment. What I said had to be backed up in the story that God actually wanted to ambush Jehoshaphat with blessing. How many of you need an ambush of blessing? <laughs> That's the title of my message, is ambushed by blessing. <laughs> it's like you get the bad news of the world, you lose your job, you get called into the office, and you go, ah, I lost my job or whatever. How, you know what, I, I don't know whether to read the news anymore or not, because you're just ambushed with more bad news, isn't it? And I'm going, I want a news a, a, a paper, what do they, they don't call them that anymore, what do they call them now, a news, I want reporters, I want people to tell me, I want to be ambushed by blessing, I want to tell you, that's why you should come to church, because the whole week the world is ambushing you with bad news and difficulties, and you know, there's load shedding, and blah, 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 blah. but when we come to church, we should be ambushed with God's blessing. We should be ambushed with God's word. We should be ambushed. It's like, I want to, I want to, you know that, actually in the story you'll see, it says that God set an ambush uh, of blessing uh, of, against his enemies. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting so excited. I'm ready to be blessed. How many of you? And you know what? I don't say that. This is not a like, uh, oh, I'm blessed, church. No, no. I, 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 I want to tell you that this word, when we get to blessing, it's not just blessed, it's prosperity. It's it's more than just a bless. I bless you, brother. No, no, no. This is a new state of being. It's going to a whole new level. It's not just, oh, I got a discount. I'm blessed. <laughs> or I got a new car. I'm blessed. No, man. That's because you just earn more and you can afford more, man. 
when you are truly coming to the prosperity and blessing of God, it's not about money, it's not about things, it's about a whole new state of being. Come on. So anyway, now when next time you feel like the enemy comes and he's going like, you, you, God's angry with you, just say, Jehoshaphat. So you just say that out loud, Jehoshaphat. In the, in the, you know, when you're in the lift, Jehoshaphat, like, who, who they, what do you do? No, God has judged Jesus, so I'm free, you know. So just remember that. Will you remember that? Good. You, I hope you never forget it. Just let's all say, Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat. Let's say it with luck, luck there. Come on, Google, right like, Jehoshaphat. Wow, you see, God heard, God heard. So anyway, let me get on with my message, otherwise I'm not going to finish. So, so what happens is, 17, he becomes king, and he's a good king. I mean, the Bible describes him as the Lord established him. He walked in the ways. He was, had great riches and honor. He was courageous. He taught people. In fact, um, he had an army of over 1.1 million trained soldiers. That's a big army. I reckon Putin would want that kind of army today <laughs> instead of them running away. So here it is. He has got a, an army that is dedicated. They're faithful. They fear God. It's going well for him. But then he does something a little stupid. He goes down to Israel, the same Jewish people, but they've been at war at each other. And so he makes an alliance with King Ahab. Now, I tell you what, King Ahab would be exactly the same as Putin today, okay? All right? So, this is like, so King Ahab, he wants his, King Ahab's daughter, so he marries his daughter, but he makes an alliance with Ahab, stupid man. And so now Ahab wants to go and annex some territory that he thinks is his. So he coerces and manipulates Jehoshaphat into going with him into the battle to go and get this place. But he... he he, um, and he says to Jehoshaphat, he said, listen, you wear your kingly robes, I'm going to go in my jeans, all right? So they won't even know who I am, all right? So he says, stupid, I don't know why Jehoshaphat did it. So Jehoshaphat puts on his kingly robes and says, everybody, here I am the king, take a shot. But what happens is in the battle, Ahab is hiding because he is one of those kind of, man, he's, a, he's a manipulative, controlling spirit, and it's hiding in the battle. So Ahab's hiding in the battle, and Jehoshaphat, who has been, he's like, he's a, and, and so the enemy comes, hey, there's the king, and Jehoshaphat shouts out, no, 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 I'm not King Ahab, and they go, oh, okay, not you, but then some random oak takes a pot at this guy in jeans, didn't know that he was the king, shoots him, and the prophecy that had been prophesied that the dogs would lick up his blood came true. Yeah, you see it. Man, do you read your Bible? There's the, hey, the oh, it's beautiful, wild stories. Man, okay. So I want to whet your appetite. When are you going to go home? You're going to read what? Two Chronicles 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and you're just going to finish in Revelation. <laughs> come on, come on. All right, so. He comes back to Jerusalem after this battle. He gets out of the battle by the skin of his chinny chin chin, and he gets back there, and he thinks, whoo, I'm still alive, whoo But what happens is a prophet meets him and says, hey, listen, but you know what? You dishonored God and so forth. And here he is, this Jehoshaphat, because he knows that God has judged, is not the thing. He actually just quickly repents because he knows grace is there. And so he quickly repents, and he puts reforms in, and he starts to put people in good leadership, and he teaches them uh, this leadership, and he, he appoints them, and he, tells, he teaches them how to fear God, how to worship God. He teaches them how to be faithful in life, and he teaches them how to have full-hearted devotion to, to their work. It's like, I want to send this to the ANC, to the government of South Africa, and just go, hey, will you please read chapter 18? And just go and do this. You know, if our government would just learn, if they would just fear God, be faithful, because he says, don't take bribes. Don't be corrupt. So he teaches, man, and the nation is in prosperity. It's just, man, they can't just, they've got so much money and riches and fame. It's going so good. Until you get to chapter 20, and it says this. After this, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and with them, some of the Meonites came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from, abon uh, from beyond the sea. 
I mean, he's just chilling in his house and his palace. Things are going well. Prosperity is coming in. He's done good. You know what? It's just like urban life because we've grown up. We've grown up. Let's grow up. Hey, what's happening? We're going like, yes, I'm going to believe in the Lord. We're going to be faithful. Yeah, Lord, we're going to do these things. We're, we're going to put things in place. How many of you have been putting things in place? Like, I'm going to start tithing, and I'm going to start honoring God, and there's prosperity comes. And But what happens is it's good because you tithe for two or three, four months, and then comes an ambush. You drive your car just for a regular service, and what was going to be two grand is 20 grand. And then you go, mm. I'm being ambushed. Anybody being ambushed by like that? Anybody go like, oh, okay, now do I tithe or do I fix my car? Hey, this always happens. I want to tell you, when you start to grow up, the enemy is coming to try and ambush you. Anybody been there? Anybody there? I want to give you good news today. It's not because you've done wrong. It's because you're doing right. It's because you're honoring. It's because you're growing. And that devil hates to see God's people grow. The devil hates it when you begin to be obedient. The devil hates it when you, put to God, when you begin to put God first and you start to honor him. The devil hates it when you begin to love your wife and when you begin to submit to your husband. The devil hates it. He's going to come with an ambush. He's going to all of a sudden... And so here was Jehoshaphat, everything going good. And the next thing, they burst into his presence. <laughs> There's millions of people down in a valley, and they're coming for you. Let's look what happens. So he says, and Jehoshaphat was afraid. <laughs> you know what? I take great courage from that. How many of you are afraid? When, you know, you're just like, ah! And then, you know, people go to you, you go to somebody, you go like, ah, you know, this is it, I... I, I I've got to pay 20 grand for my car, and, and I just trust in the Lord, man. Like, <laughs> it's easy for you, but if you haven't got money, how do I get my car out? Hey? Or well, something else happens, and, you know, you're like the doctor's diagnosed, and oh, I just trust in the Lord. Go to Chris. Chris prays for you, but nothing happens. And you go like, oh, what? It's easy. Oh, I just trust in the Lord, man. You'll be healed. You know, it's okay to be afraid. Do you know that? It's okay to be afraid. That God has given us emotions. But it's the response from being afraid that is so important. Because what is, I stopped. I should have finished. It says, and Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord. Now, this is the difference between me and Jehoshaphat. Because, you know, Jehoshaphat set his face to seek the Lord. If I had 1.1 million soldiers, I would have gone, woohoo, let's go and take them on, man. <laughs> we're all trained, we're faithful, we're good, we got it, this is it, we made for battle, let's go, let's go. What's that brave art guy? <laughs> William, Wallace. William Wallace is just like, yeah, you know. And, and you see, for me, that's I'm this top eight in the Enneagram. I'm this, you know, front guy. You give me anything, I'm just going to be a bulldozer pioneer. And the problem is that, as what Ecclesiastes says, he who breaks through a wall can get bitten by a snake. If you dig a hole, you could fall in it. <laughs> Did you know that's the Bible? It is. Read your Bible, guys, man. You should be saying, amen. That is Ecclesiastes X, Y, Z. So, I love Jehoshaphat's humility. He doesn't put his, he doesn't, so here, here's the thing. I'm giving you some, here's how do you deal with an ambush in your life? How do you allow God to ambush you with blessing when the enemy is ambushing you? Because you know what? The enemy's come, Jesus said this, he's come to kill, to destroy, and to rob from you. Rob, kill, and destroy. That's the enemy. He lies to you. He'll want to kill you. He wants to kill your purpose. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to do, he doesn't, he doesn't, he hates anybody who has a citizenship in heaven, hates them, hates you. So he wants to do that. So how do you turn the tables on the enemy? Here is the story. Here is a way that God gives. And this Jehoshaphat, man who understands the grace of God, that God has judged his sin, but now he has to set his face on seeking the Lord. The first thing you do is run to seek the face of the Lord. Don't put your strength, don't, don't put... Um, don't put your faith in your, in your strength. Don't put your faith in, you know, when I lost all my, my, you know, the money in that business and I had to start again and I took response. I said, God, I dug this hole. I'm going to get myself out of it. Have you ever tried to get out the same hole that you've dug? You just dig a deeper hole. 
I just kept going deeper and deeper and deeper. And God had to teach me in that that he ambushed me with this one thing. And it was this, that God could do more in a moment than I could do in a lifetime. <laughs> when I thought that I could gonna get, I got myself in, I'm going to get myself out. And he just stood back and said, okay, let's watch. And he just deeper and deeper until I realized, God, I want you to do more in a moment than I could do in a lifetime. The second thing that happened is that Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. He just called everybody. I wonder if the first thing that when we are ambushed, whether it may be a very difficult thing in a marriage and maybe your spouse has cheated on you or is going to divorce you or that there is a difficulty, a disease, or a, somebody has done something, what is the first thing we do? Do we run to the people of God or do we run away from the people of God? I had too many people that are going like, I can't come to church with this because of that and what, and da, 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 and I, nobody, they won't like me anymore. They're thinking different on me. Friends, I want to tell you that as a people knowing that God has judged our sin, that we run to the people of God and we seek God together. It's in this place. It's in this place. And then he goes on and he says, and Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly in Judah and Jerusalem, the house of the Lord, and he began to remember the promises. He says, God, I, he quotes the promises. He says, you know what? You made a covenant with Abraham that this would be our inheritance. So he's standing there. The enemy wants to take this territory. And the thing, he doesn't go and shout at the enemy. He doesn't go and rebuke the enemy. He goes to God and he reminds God that this is his territory that he has given to them. And I hear too many people shouting at the devil and commanding the devil and doing all of this. The Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of the Lord and resist the devil. It doesn't say shout at the devil. It doesn't say talk to the devil. It doesn't say worship the devil. It doesn't do any of that. It says, come, just go and seek the face of the Lord. It says, turn your heart to begin to sing. Turn your heart. He, 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 he reminds God of his promises. Do you know that you can go to God and say, God, this is the promise you've given to us. He loves it when we remind him of his promises. You got it? It's like, I, please, we, in this church, we don't shout and rebuke the devil and get on. When I was on the phone, I didn't go like, hey, in the name, I rebuke you, devil. I was going to like, God, would you deal with the devil as we worship you? That's way more powerful. You know what? It takes more faith. Because you start shouting at the devil, you start rebuking and that, and the devil laughs at you, man. He does not worry about that because he's ta you've taken your face and your eyes off Jesus. So let's just keep our eyes, eyes, eyes on Jesus. It's hard. Are you putting, oh, who are you looking at? He says, they sought the face of God. Who are you looking at? Are you looking at your problem? Are you looking at the devil? Are you blaming the devil? Are you doing that? No, no. Just go and worship God. Just, just, oh God, I want to remind you of the promise that you've given to me. I want to remind you. And then he, he goes through this whole thing of the possession, and he says, our eyes are on you. That's why, hey, in our worship, and when we come and we talk about this, I say to the worship team, what is, what is our purpose? What's our function as ministers of the gospel? It's to get everyone to worship God. We, we do. How do you like our new stage? Did you even know we got a new stage? How many of you didn't realize we got a new stage? Okay, don't tell us. Uh, but we've, we've put a big dish in the top here. It's a halo. It's a glory. No, no, it's not. Okay. But <laughs> we, we, we want to paint it nice. We want to do nice things. But hey, our purpose is not to, hey, look at us. Our purpose is to say, come on, let's worship God. That's the focus. Yes. And so this is what he does. And, and then I better get back to my notes. Have I got, I've got a few minutes. Sorry? What happens out of that is a prophet stands up. And this prophet is Jahaziel, and he gets up and he begins to prophesy. He begins to speak the word of God. So in this place where they were fearful, but they come and they just begin to worship God. And they keep their face, and they remind God of his promises, and they remind him of his covenant, and they keep their eyes focused on him out of the presence of God, out of this place of worship, out of this incredible moment. A prophet stands up, and he gives them 
as such an encouraging word. And I trust that today is an encouraging word. I trust that today would be this. And this is the crux. And you've probably heard it before, but now you'll see it in context. Because he gets up and he says, Listen, O Judah, the inhabitants, inhabitants of Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat. He says, This is what the Lord is saying to you. Do not be afraid. I want to say to you this morning, I don't know what you're facing, but I want to say to you, do not be afraid. I know, just keep your eyes focused on him. Do not be afraid. He says, do not be dismayed at this great horde. <laughs> now, Joseph hadn't even seen the horde. He just heard about it, and that brought fear. Imagine if he had gone to the lookout point and seen the horde. He said, don't look at the problem. Just keep looking at him. And then this is what he says. He says, for the battle is not yours, but it's God's. I'm going to tell you the battle. When you know that God has judged your sin, then you're not worried. Is God going to, is he going to hit me? Is he going to punish me? No, you live in the grace of God knowing that the battle that you face is not yours, it's God's. When we keep our eyes focused on him, he will deal with the enemy. We don't have to shout at the enemy. We don't have to do anything. We just have to keep our eyes focused on him. And then he goes on. He says, tomorrow, go down against them. Behold, they're going to come up. Tells them where they're going to come up. So he gives them insight. Oh, boy. Imagine having a prophet on, on your board, uh, in your boardroom. Imagine being the prophet in your boardroom. Maybe in your, in your, in your whatever it is, you're finding yourself going like, what do we do now? And the prophet stands up and you go, I want to tell you that the, our, our, in, the, our opposition, they're going to do that. So let's do that. And so he says, you will not need to fight in this battle. <laughs> Imagine hearing that. It's like these 1.1 trained soldiers. They're just going like, dush, dush, dush. they're doing their press-ups. And then they're doing their stretches. Ooh, ooh, we're going to battle. Ooh. And the other people are going, yeah, 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 you know. Just, but they, you're not gonna, what? We're not going to fight? Did you, did you, what? What? You're not going to, I'm a soldier. I'm made for fighting. So, no, no, you're not going to fight. He says, stand, hold your position to see the salvation of the Lord. Wow. Stand. Hold your position, you're going to see the salvation of God. You see, when God spoke to us over a year ago, it said, come, position yourself for change, position yourself to grow spiritually, and learn how to worship in spirit and in truth. Three things that this church, Urban Life, that we've begun to do. And I go, let's hold our position. <laughs> there may come some ambush, and we may be feeling what's happening, but we're just going to go stand. And when, and when God speaks, because out of this, something beautiful comes from it. And he goes, Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. All of, Jeho all of the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down. They worshiped the Lord <laughs> and with a very loud voice. Say very loud voice. Very loud voice. Thank you. There's only one of us that actually obeyed. Okay, let's say it with a very loud voice now. Very loud voice. we get in there. You see, Actually, it's the leaders, and it's got to be the king, and it's, it, Jesus has gone first, and he showed us the way, but we as leaders and as pastors, we've got to show the way. You guys say, well, why do, they, why do we want the leaders? Do you want to be in the front row? Anybody can come sit in the front row. This front row is not holy in any way. All I want is that I want the leaders in this front row so that you can see them shouting with a very loud voice. Because if they don't shout with a very loud voice, you won't. We've got to go first. I want to show that these people here, they actually dance and, and they go crazy. Why? Because God has done something in us and we want to show you. But you can come join us. So next week, will you all come and sit in the front row or the second row? I want that to be the most full rows. Why? Because you're showing other people what God's done in your life. Come on. You've got to stand in the front. So then it says, and they rose early in the morning and they went down to the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, hear me, O Judah. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem, he says, believe, have faith in the Lord and have faith in the word that has come to us. That was from the prophet. The prophet said, you're not going to have to have fight. So I don't know about you, but if somebody had prophesied that and I'm the king, that night I would have gone like, okay, so the soldiers, they're not fighting. How the heck are you going to win? I think the best way is to get Phil to have his cymbals because then he can kind of, like if he picked up his cymbals and then maybe we've got some sticks and, and these guitars and maybe the keyboards, we could throw them at the enemy. I'm, I'm being silly, but can you imagine what it must be like? Okay, the soldiers are not, the soldiers, the soldiers? 
We're not going to fight. It's the battle of the Lord. What are we going to do? It's just going to be worship, sing. Are you crazy? And, and then God starts singing. He starts singing a song because Jehoshaphat was obviously a singer. He was a praiser. He was a shout louder. He was a man that began to begin to sing and praise. And, and I don't know what he was, you know, singing, but I think we get an inclination because he starts to say, and this is when I need some of those that are minstrels to come and help us, because he says, and when he had taken counsel of the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord. These are these guys. We've appointed them to sing to the Lord and praise him, okay, in holy attire, and as they went before them, he goes like, okay, guys, what are we going to sing? <laughs> what are we going to sing? Is it like, what are we going to sing, mud? What are, you, what are we going to sing? What do, you, what do you think? What key we in there? C sharp, C minor. Are we gonna, sharp, sharp. We're going to be in a sharp. Okay, we've got sharp. Uh, what beat we got there? 6, 8, 6, 4, 6, 10. What is it? All of them. Okay, no, no. We need to be in r proper rhythm. Give us, what's the, what's the rhythm? 4-4, four, four. all right. We're in 4-4, four, four. guys. What is it, Sean? Following You're following him. All right, we got it there. And then the MD here, Rebecca. What do we, one, two, and five, or six, seven, four, four, five. Have you seen her call out there? Five, six, seven, whatever. Okay, what, what song are we singing here? And they go like, um, we don't know. We don't know, boss. You know, kind of like king, king, what do we do? So he says, well, like I tell you what, last night I went to, to 1 Chronicles chapter 16 because this was a song of David. David wrote the song. And, and it was a song that he wrote when he took the Ark of the Covenant because they had abandoned the covenant and they'd lost the covenant, this box, this beautiful picture of God. And they'd, they'd, they'd sent it off into war one day and they'd lost it to the enemy and then the enemy sent it back and it had sat in someone's house. But David wanted to give it a place of great prominence in, in Jerusalem. He knew it was there. And so he, he, he takes it and he puts it in a tent and he sings. David sings. He was a psalmist. He sings and he dances. In fact, he gets so hot, he starts taking his clothes off. And his wife looks at him and goes, she takes offense. It's like, you, a king, you dancing like this and the maiden's watching you. And you know how many religious people stand in church today and go, Chris, dancing like that on the stage. Sister. Aish. We're just like that, aren't we? But David says, I'll become even more undignified than that because I'm going to worship God. So he said, well, what's that song? It's, 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 it's a song in, in 1 Chronicles 16. And it says, I'll give thanks to the Lord for He is good. So in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, it just gives us two lines. But that's like the title of the song. They didn't just go, I give thanks to the Lord for His good. I give thanks to the Lord for His good. I give thanks to the Lord for His good. I give thanks to the Lord for His good. I give thanks. No, it was the title of a song. So they're like, oh, yes, it's that song. If I had to say, um, uh, no one. What song is that? Yeah. If I had to say, Amazing Grace, what's that song? How many of you can carry on? Amazing Grace. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. You see it? They sung it. You've sung that song how many times? All right? All right, but they sang a different song. They sang this song, which is give thanks to the Lord for He is good. Now, we, we don't have that tune, but we have the words. And so this is it. He puts, goes like, okay, guys. These are the musos. I want all of those that are singers. Okay, there it is. We got hope. We've got a couple of singers up here. All right, where's your, where's your microphone? All right, we've got a couple. All right, we're going to start singing the song and, and we're going into battle. And then the guys go, Look, this king has lost his marbles. But as they begin to sing, it says that God set an ambush. Here we go. Let me read it to you. It says, God set an ambush against them and he routed them. 
And so when the people of God came over the hill, as they looked out over, there were millions of people just dead in the, in the, in the valley. You know what happened? It says it took three days. Say three days. Three days for them to collect the spoils from the enemy. Three days. Now, if you've got 1.1 million soldiers that are all buffed and strong, how much loot can you pick up for three days? Lots. Do you want to tell you, I'm telling you this now, is that the enemy is coming laden with spoil. He's coming laden with goods. And he's, God has herded him into a valley because they renamed that valley the Valley of Barakah. Say Barakah. That's the land, the valley of blessing. That's why I was saying God was, He wants to ambush you with blessing, Alex. He wants to ambush you with blessing. Mash, He wants to ambush you with blessing. He wants to ambush you with blessing. Why? Because the enemy is coming to destroy you, to kill, to try and destroy and do what God, what against what God wants in your life. <laughs> but God has set an ambush as we begin to worship. God sets an ambush. Come on, let's stand. Are you with me? Are you ready to sing? Are you ready to worship? Are you ready to go and stand? Are we going to sing the song? What are we going to sing? Eh? Give thanks for the Lord is good. His love today, remember she quoted out of a Psalm 51 it's a time when David had actually messed up and he had, had committed adultery had murdered and he comes back to God and he, he just says God I've messed up he says I, I want to get back will you, if you read it in the message it says would you, would you would you start a Genesis week in me you know what that means it says will you, will you come and start recreating me from the chaos in my life. I don't know what chaos may be reigning in your life. I don't know if sin has been reigning in your life. I don't know if there's chaos or whether there's an ambush. You may be doing good stuff, bad stuff, whatever it is, but there is stuff. And he's going, God, would you come create in me a new heart of God? But then he, he moves on from that, having known that God has forgiven him. And then he says this. He says, I want to sing an anthem of praise you unbutton my lips you know when Kelsey read that the other day in our preach meeting she was reading and I, I don't know I got a real weird imagination but I just saw lips button like a, and I, I like I said Chris Chris you need to you need to give me a face with a button in the lips you know Eugene Peterson who wrote the message he didn't say unzip my lips he said unbutton my lips and so it's like I went I can still talk, you know. I know you're tough, but you know. Okay, put your fingers like buttons on your lips. All right, 
Now try sing. Try sing. I can't hear you. <laughs> so my question to you is this, what's buttoning your lips? I wrote down, said, Lord, what, what is buttoning my lips? And, then, and you know what I find is that it could be fear. It's like I'm afraid. I'm, I'm in fear, God. I, I, uh, it could be religion. It's like I haven't sung songs like that. It, it could be prejudices. It could be uh, um, tendencies. It could be culture. You know, um, we men don't sing. Certainly in church. You know, when we're in rugby, yeah, then we sing. But no. <laughs> or when we're in the bar, yes, then we sing. You know. But it, it could be that you, you've overcome by sin and you feel like God is judging you. I, I want to tell you this morning, friends, is that God wants to come and unbutton your lips. And so I started writing a whole lot of things that could button our lips. And then I s- made a new list and I said, what unbuttons our lips? And as I was going to write that, the Holy Spirit said to me, Craig, it's not what unbuttons your lips, it's who unbuttons your lips. And I said, oh, Jesus. That's what, that's what David prayed. He said, Lord, would you open my mouth? Would you unbutton my lips? It's like really, it's quite intimate when you, like, you know, you, can you imagine? <laughs> Let me come and unbutton his lips. You know? Okay, just to your spouse. Okay, just come on, come on, come on, come on. Ladies, try and unbutton. No, no, that's kissing. That's, that's, that's cheating. That's cheating. You can still kiss with a button. Oh, baby. Okay, we better not go down there. No. How many of us need our lips unbuttoned <laughs> and, and you know what it's not what we can do it's the one who has taken our judgment it's the one who's taken our sin it's the one who has set us free he's the one his name is Jesus and when he comes with these gracious hands there was a man that had buttoned lips in the Bible he was mute he couldn't speak imagine coming to Jesus <laughs> Jesus has this incredible compassion upon him. And his lips are unbuttoned and he begins to worship. Are you being ambushed? I believe that God wants to bring you into the valley of Baraka. He wants to bring you into the valley of blessing. But before that, he wants to come and unbutton our lips. So I believe that if we would just begin to sing, if we would just begin to praise him loudly, yeah. Come on. You know what? All your conservatism. See, I was a stutterer. I didn't speak. I wasn't loud. You say, Craig, you're so loud. You're an extrovert. I'm not an extrovert. I'm an introvert. But when God touched my lips and unbuttoned them, one day I was in my office and the Spirit of God hit me and I shook and religion shook off me and I was filled with the Spirit of God and I got loud. I don't know why I got loud, but I got loud because I think heaven is loud and it is loud. You see, when heaven and earth begin to sing, then all sorts of things begin to happen. 